Good afternoon, Highline Community College. Hello. Good afternoon. Oh, yeah. That's how we do at Highline, right? <laughs> well, welcome. I'm so pleased um, for you all to be here for our kickoff event for Unity Through Diversity Week. It's our 17th annual week. Um, and I'm really excited about the programs and activities that we have going on um, this week. My name is Natasha Burroughs, and I'm the Director for Multicultural Affairs, and I'm also the Chair um, for Unity Week this year. Um, and Unity Week through Diversity Week is um, a time where well, we do this all year, but this is a time where we bring in people from all over the world, all over the nation, who are experts and activists and community organizers, change agents, scholars, to come here and be in dialogue with us about issues of um, equity and social change and what that looks like. And our theme this week is reimagining the imagination, creating action for social change. So we want to open our minds and just kind of be able to dream something different and to bring something different into reality, to think outside the box. And that's what we're hoping um, the week will really be about. So we have a whole schedule. I hope you guys got one of these handy dandy handbills um, that lays out some of the events that we have going on throughout the week. You all are invited VIP, because you're the first ones to come to Unity Week. So please come join us. Um, you are welcome. And really, this is all for you guys. So I hope you'll come. Um, I wanted to say a special thanks to our Unity Week planning committee. First and foremost, I wanted to give a special acknowledgement to Ms. Chayuda Overby, who came here from Green River. <laughs> she was our first Unity Week chair. She was actually the chair of Unity Week, and she got a new opportunity to work over at Green River. So I wanted to acknowledge her work for setting the foundation for this week. So thank you very much, Tayuda, for that, your leadership around that. I um, also want to give a special shout out to all of our planning committee members, which um, includes Daryl Bryce. Raise your hand. <laughs> Notorious. Sharon, if she's here, Sam, Patricia McDonald, Amy Moon, Jean Monroe, Janita, Aisha, and Moy Lee. That was like brilliant minds coming together for this week. So I want to thank all the planning committee members for all your work on this. It does not happen alone. So with that, you guys aren't really here to hear me speak. <laughs> we have a really awesome opportunity to hear from um, an honored guest today, and so we're going to get about that business. Um, so with that, uh, the person that's going to be introducing our speaker today is Lisa Scari, our Vice President for Institutional Advancement. Can you guys give her a welcome? So Natasha took all my words I was going to say about Unity Week and promoting it. Um, but I also do want to say that the committee has put together a great program this week of not only presentations and speakers, um, and I think, and events, I should say. Um, so, so please participate and enjoy in their good work. Um, and I actually have the honor today of introducing our first distinguished speaker. Named by US News and World Report as one of America's best leaders of 2009, Ibu Patel is the founder and president of the Interfaith Youth Corps, an organization that builds the interfaith movement on college campuses. He served on President Obama's inaugural Advisory Council of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships and holds a doctorate in sociology of religion from Oxford University. Ibu was named by Islamica magazine as one of 10 young Muslim visionaries shaping Islam in America and he was also chosen by Harvard Kennedy School Review as one of five future policy leaders to watch. Both Ibu and the Interfaith Youth Corps were honored with the Roosevelt Institute's Freedom of Worship Medal in 2009, and he was recently awarded the Guru Nanak Interfaith Prize, an award given to an individual to enhance awareness of the crucial role of religious dialogue in pursuit of peace. Now, I had the pleasure of hearing Ibu speak last fall and found his words inspiring, but at the same time, they challenged my thoughts about the intersect of faith and higher education. In essence, he left me reimagining my thinking about 
the faith conversation on our campus and its relationship to social change. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ibu Patel. Thank you. <clears throat> so you know what gets left off that bio is uh, I grew up in and around community colleges. And uh, uh, I got, I remember when I was like eight or nine years old, my mom, uh, who up until that time was a full-time homemaker, decided to go back to get her CPA. And she had a BA from India, but obviously you have to take a whole set of other classes to go ahead and be a certified public accountant. And she, not all of her classes transferred. So what she would do with me, who was you know in fourth grade, she would drive me uh, all across the western suburbs of Chicago from community college to community college where she was taking these different classes and stick me in the snack room with like, you know, 50 math problems. I was like the nine-year-old Indian kid eating Doritos, doing multiplication in the snack room while she went to take classes and uh, uh, winds up getting her CPA. So I watched my mom go through that process and, you know, uh, it's a very like uh, Indian thing, but when she f when 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 the uh, when her exam came in, when the results came in, I was at a friend's house, like you know, four blocks away, and I heard my mom on the stoop of our apartment calling across the neighborhood, "Ibu, I passed." And my friend Scott was like, "What the heck is?" I'm like, "That's just the way we do in the Patel household, right?" But that's you know that's. Community colleges, right? It's, there, is, there is no place in a geographical area that is a better reflection of that place's aspirations than a community college, right? If you want to know what a particular geography is about, go to that community college and take the pulse, and that's where you'll find out. And it wasn't just those few years. Uh, my mom winds up getting a dream job which is to be a full-time faculty member at a community college. So she works for McDonald's in their accounting department and a bunch of other companies in their accounting departments decides she didn't want to do that. She wants to go back to where she found a springboard into America, which was a community college. And so for the last 25 years, my mom has been a full-time professor of accounting at a community college. And I took my first classes, my first college classes there. Uh, in, probably started the summer of my, of my freshman year. It's where I, I first discovered that no matter how hard I tried, I just was never gonna be an accountant. So thank God to community colleges for closing off a certain set of paths <laughs> that, that I, uh, I, I knew I wasn't gonna take. But you know, for me, um, high school felt like a race. It felt like a single race. And, and the only way to, to do it well was to go faster, right? But that just, that, that just wasn't me. Uh, I just, just didn't want to run that race. And it was in Carter Carroll's history class, it was in Werner Kriegelstein's philosophy class, uh, it was in Alan Carter's fiction writing class, it was in the first sociology class that I took. I was like 15, 16, 17 years old that this whole new world opened up to me. You know, I first read Bernard Malamud at a community college. I first read uh, Plato's Allegory of the Cave at a community college. And it's just, it's a joy to be back here in front of a group of students and faculty and staff and administrators who are a part of that process, a part of the process of reimagining your lives, this community, this country. I just think it's, it's very, very powerful and it reminds me of, uh, of formative years in my life. So thank you so much for the opportunity to come back and, and just be a part of this community's aspirations as it's reflected in this institution's and in this room right now. Yeah, that, that hand is for you all. That hand is for you all. Uh, so I wanna, um, you know, like a lot of you, uh, I, I, had the, I had the opportunity to transfer from that community college to a four-year university. And uh, uh, really the first part of my story starts at that four-year university. And you know what? This is a story over the arc of this talk. What, what I'm going to do is basically talk about how it is that I came to realize the significance of religious diversity issues and to believe that it was part of the, the promise and responsibility of this country to engage those issues positively and that the particular institution best situated to do that were college campuses and that the particular people who ought to be on the vanguard were young people. 
And what I'm going to do over the course of the next half hour or so uh, is, is to basically trace the arc of that in three parts. One is I want to tell you how I came to recognizing the significance of these issues, my, my own story on this. Uh, the second is I, I want to talk about uh, the, the complications and challenges and opportunities of diversity for this community, for America, and for the world. And, and I see folks wearing a button that I love, celebrate diversity. You know, I'm actually going to complicate the idea of diversity a little bit. I'm going I'm to say, you know, diversity doesn't always have to be a good thing. It's all about how we engage it. So that's part two. And then part three is I want to actually tell you the story of uh, uh, a woman from Seattle and how she experienced religious diversity issues in college. Her name is Cassie Meyer. She's a colleague of mine at Interfaith Youth Corps. And I thought about her story because she's from these parts and you know, probably walked some of these streets as you all did. I happen to know her well because we've worked together at IFYC for eight years. I want to tell you a little bit about her journey and especially how college changed her life when it came to religious diversity issues. So it's a story of understanding and engaging religious diversity in those three parts. And I'll begin from time when I was 17 years old. Uh, I was at the University of Illinois. It's when I had transferred there from taking classes at the College of DuPage over summers when I was in high school. And uh, the, first, the first memory I have of being a freshman at the University of Illinois was walking onto the basketball court. And there's three games going on. There's a white game, a black game, and an Asian game. And uh, I started instinctively walking over to the white game. And then I stopped. And I, I looked around, and what I realized was nobody else was walking to the white game, right? That folks felt perfectly comfortable playing in the own kind of flow of their communities. And what I realized at that moment, right, it's, there's, there's moments in your life when, like, your whole past kind of flashes before you, right? Uh, it was, my gosh, I'd spent a long time trying to play in the white game. And it was this kind of crazy realization to look around and be like, it's so interesting that there are robust and proud communities of different identities in this gym. And there's a sense of comfort in their own identity. And I had this sense like, wow, I feel like I ha maybe I haven't really been comfortable in my skin. And that's not entirely a metaphor. Now here's the crazy and wonderful thing about college, is that I probably had that same or a similar kind of realization in variety of times in high school. You know, when I was in high school, uh, the Rodney King stuff went down, and I remember exactly one teacher making one comment about it, saying uh, when the verdict happened, uh, acquitted, right? He just said, the verdict was acquitted. Nobody asked any questions. Nobody seemed to care. And I thought to myself, well, th you know, there's, there's something at play here, and I feel like it implicates me in a distinct way, but because there was no processing of it, there was no community that engaged it, it just evaporated. But the beautiful thing about college is that that's not how it was, right? There was a community of people constantly engaged in asking diversity questions. You couldn't walk 10 feet in any direction in 1993 on a college campus without running into some folks reading Cornell West or Bell Hooks or Audre Lorde. The conversation around diversity, especially when it came to race and gender and ethnicity, increasingly sexuality and class back then, it was a live conversation. And I reveled in it because, like I said, for all of those years, I'd had this strange sense of like not fully fitting in my skin. You know, when I was eight years old, I have this distinct recollection of trying to scratch brown skin white, my brown skin white, and nobody ever talked about it. You know, I remember when my mom first put samosas, you all know what samosas are? Okay, so back in like 1987 when my mom first put samosas in my lunch, nobody knew what samosas were, at least nobody around where I grew up. They just could smell them from 25 feet away. You know, and, and I like look at my mom, like putting samosas in my lunch bag, and I'm like, you know, first you name me Ibu, you know, <laughs> and now, you, I mean, seriously, you know, uh, so it was, it was powerful for me to be in sociology classes where race was talked about directly. 
right? To be in uh, freshman orientation sessions where you play crossing the line and, and somebody asked, you know, who, who felt embarrassed by the food that was cooked at home? And it was no longer my dirty personal little secret. Like half the room crossed the line, right? That was, a, that was a powerful thing for me. And I, I think back to myself, just how grateful I am for the live diversity conversations in college when, when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. And I think that that's a lot of what Unity and Diversity Week is, is meant to do here, is to create space and give voice to things that, you know, are s unbelievably important and very frequently challenging to talk about. And I think American higher ed ought to take uh, ought to take a bow, honestly, for the way it has courageously engaged race issues. It's, it is far from an easy thing to talk about, and yet, in academic program after academic program, on campus after campus, you have things like the Intercultural Center. You have things like global studies, right? You have an institution, a sector of American society that says, we're gonna engage this. Now, there's reasonable arguments to be made on multiple sides about about should it be engaged more or in different ways, et cetera. But the fact is, this institution hasn't ignored it, and that's a big deal. So, uh, like you know, any good student sent off to college uh, and who takes what he's reading seriously, uh, I went back to my parents' house with piles of dirty laundry, my hand out looking for uh, decent food. This time, at, at this point, I was actually proud of my parents' ethnic food by the time I was 18, 19 years old. And, and large quantities of lectures to give my dad with all the wisdom I had acquired by being at the University of Illinois for nine months. I don't, I don't know if you guys have tried this yet. You know, you read Edward Said or Karl Marx or who, Audrey, and you just, you're like, you know, mom, you gotta hear this, right? Because like, we, we've been doing it wrong for the last 40 years, right? We gotta, we gotta change. I'm like, I remember the first time, I was like, mom, workers of the world unite. She was like, what the heck are you talking? It's like, don't say that to anybody, okay? Uh, uh, and I would, I, it would have long, and voluble conversations, monologues, at least from my side, towards my dad about race and diversity issues, right? Uh, uh, this was like people of color unite type stuff. And uh, super important stuff, you know, I would, uh, and, and my dad, who, you know, it's funny when I think about this, you know, my dad was, uh, was one of like a handful of, of international students at Notre Dame University in the mid-1970s. He was one of the first non-white people in corporate advertising in the Midwest. It's like, it's not like my dad never experienced feeling marginalized, but you know, he mostly good-naturedly took the lectures I gave him about the importance of diversity issues, et cetera. At one point, I, I, I must confess, when I used the word bourgeois, he said, if you ever use the word bourgeois in my house, again, you can find some other bourgeois dad to help with your bourgeois college tuition. <laughs> so. I hope that that's a word you're learning and, and uh, uh, in dissecting in class, I would just caution you about where to use it. Um, my dad at one point says something else to me which changed the course of my life. He, uh, he said, you know, Ibu, for all you talk about diversity issues, you never talk about the diversity issue that's driving the world, and that's religious diversity. It's almost like you don't even know the New York Times exists or you don't know that you know, the evening news exists. Uh, all you do is pay attention to a segment of diversity stuff. It's not that that stuff's not important, it's just that it's not the only thing that's important. So, so open your eyes, kid, and the next time you wanna come here and lecture me on diversity issues, I want you to first tell me how you're gonna solve religious conflict. And I like literally remember you know, taking the clean clothes that my parents had laundered for me and and folded and you know the food that my mom had made for me and putting it in the back of the Oldsmobile that my dad had let me borrow and driving back south on I-57 to the University of Illinois thinking to myself boy my dad is a 19th century creature you know he's so he's 200 years behind the times and the next week I got a call from my best friend at the University of Illinois who's Jewish and she says and I hear the tears in her throat she says Yitzhak Rabin has just been assassinated and that's when my eyes flew wide open, right? And I started paying attention to the New York Times and I started paying attention to the evening news and I started to realize that, that outside of these diversity conversations we were having on campus, which again, were supremely important, 
They just weren't the world of diversity conversations. There was another world of diversity happening out there, and it was happening along the fault lines of religious identity, and mostly what those fault lines were doing were bleeding. Northern Ireland just experienced the Omag bombing, which set the peace process back there several years. Middle, the Middle East was in the throes of the Oslo Peace Accords, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, basically scuttled it, it seems like, forever. 20 years later, we're still in a scuttled period. When uh, the person who committed that murder was asked in court why he did it, and if he had an accomplice, he said he did have an accomplice, and the accomplice was God. When I look back at the 1990s, it looks very much like a decade of religious violence. Right? 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, basically the announcement of the global ambitions of Muslim extremism. 1995, that assassination of Yitzhak Rabin by an extremist Jewish figure, somebody from his own tradition. 1996, the bombing of the Atlanta Olympics by a man named Eric Rudolph. When he gets arraigned in court, you know how he defends himself? He reads from the New Testament. A couple of years earlier, the absolute shredding of the Balkans, Yit, uh, Slobodan Milosevic's soldiers riding into Sarajevo and other parts of Bosnia in tanks, standing up in those tanks and holding up the number three. What did that three stand for? The Trinity, as in we Christians are gonna roll over you Muslims. 1998, the election of a Hindu nationalist party in India called the BJP, about to come back to power. Incidentally, we will know in mid-May for sure. What's one of their first moves? To test a nuclear device. What do they call it? The Hindu bomb. What does Pakistan do weeks later? Test their own nuclear device. What do they call it? The Muslim bomb. The 1990s is very much a decade all about religious violence issues. And when I was in college, I probably remember the words religious diversity being mentioned together five times. Somehow we had dramatically missed this huge issue, even though it was not just dominating the front pages of the newspaper, it was also dominating academic discourse. In the early 1990s, Samuel Huntington, the Harvard political scientist, writes what becomes, people say, the second most influential article in the history of the journal Foreign Affairs. The article is called The Clash of Civilizations. Two years later, he turns it into a book. What's the central thesis of The Clash of Civilizations? With the end of the Cold War, the demise of the Soviet Union, the political and economic polarization of the world between communists and capitalists is formally over. And Huntington says that the next world order will be defined by what he calls a more primordial dimension of human identity. Not politics, not economics, but civilizational identity. He names, following the British scholar Arnold Toynbee, seven or eight different civilizations and says, what are civilizations based on? They are based on religion, which is precisely why they are fated to fight. Fated to fight. What does Huntington see? The preeminent political scientist of his time sees a world order in which people from different religious communities are at each other's throats. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking to myself, 20, 21 years old, coming of age at the dawn of a new century, I want to be a part of the right side of history. And somehow, by providence, I'm a believer, so I think God has something to do with this. Right? Somehow, I also begin to get interested in a very different religious narrative. I'm seeing in the, in the newspapers this narrative of religious conflict, but somehow people are handing me, almost randomly it seems, Dorothy Day and Martin Luther King Jr. and Badsha Khan and Mother Teresa and all of these different faith heroes. And I'm starting to realize, yes, religion can play a very negative role in the world, but can also play a beautiful and positive role in the world. And so often, the people that we come to admire most as faith heroes, or really just as heroes in general, they started their work young. So the assassin of Yitzhak Rabin was 26 years old. And we all know that religious extremists tend to be young. But the man who let the Montgomery bus boycott 
in 1955, the recent grad from Boston University just minted with his PhD, Martin Luther King Jr., was also 26 years old. And the more I looked at these people that I admired so much, Dorothy Day, all these folks from different backgrounds, Bacha Khan, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, they had started when they were so young. I started to think to myself, what if college campuses, just as they are taking race and ethnicity and gender and sexuality issues seriously, engaging those in both co-curricular and curricular efforts, what if they took religious diversity issues with equal seriousness? Now, I was part of a, a group of student leaders that met for like 30 minutes with the president of, of the University of Illinois system in the spring of 1996, and he had a line that sticks with me. He said, I want to be able to shake the hand of a graduating student from the University of Illinois and have a sense of confidence that that student has over the course of their undergraduate career acquired multicultural literacy, built multicultural relationships, and had opportunities for multicultural leadership. It started to shape up in my mind. What if college campuses from Highline Community College to Harvard, when you all cross the, the stage and shake hands with the president of your college, he or she has a sense of confidence that you have over the course of your one or two or three or four years here, when he hands you your associate's degree, or whatever degree you earn here, you have acquired interfaith literacy, inter built interfaith relationships, had opportunities for interfaith leadership. Why? Why does this matter? Part two of my story. It matters because the United States is some sociologists say the most religiously diverse nation in human history and the most religiously devout nation in the West at a time of global religious conflict. I have to tell you something. There are plenty of rooms that I am in that are a lot less interesting than this, I might say, in which I have to convince those folks that this is the most religiously diverse nation in human history. I don't have to convince you all. Just look to your left and to your right. That's a powerful thing, that you are a microcosm of this country, a microcosm of the most religiously diverse nation in human history. In a Western nation in which religion counts in ways that it doesn't count in any other Western nation, our rates of believing in God, of going to church, synagogue, mosque, temple, gurdwara, of, of saying grace before meals, of having religion involved in the discourse around politics are two, three, four, five, six times higher than in other similar countries, in Britain or in Germany or France. I remember, actually, I was uh, studying in England in the late 1990s when Tony Blair got elected prime minister there, and it was well known that Blair was a believing Christian, and somebody asked Blair's uh, 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 chief communications guy, colloquially called the spin doctor, you know, was Blair going to talk about his Christian beliefs? And the spin doctor put an end to that conversation by saying, we don't do God, and you know what? The British press never asked about it again. The American press doesn't work that way, right? <laughs> And nor does the American public. And I think that that is a very good thing. Because religious identity is at the heart of who so many people in this country are. Faith and philosophical identity. Whether you're a Christian or a secular humanist, it's at the heart of who so many people are. And why shouldn't there be a robust public conversation about that? But we can't expect that every dimension of that conversation is positive. And this is where I want to get into complicating diversity, right? So Diana Eck, a professor at Harvard that we spend a lot of time reading and studying at Interfaith Youth Corps, points out that diversity is actually just a fact. It's not a value. It's not an achievement. It's just a fact. Diversity is just the fact of people with different identities living in close quarters. It, it says nothing about what those people do with each other. And unfortunately, in a good many parts of the world, people with different identities living in close quarters with each other equals a civil war. The question is, how do we take diversity, the fact of people who are different living close to each other, and turn it into something positive, turn it into an achievement? Diana Eck calls that pluralism. Okay. 
the achievement of positive relationships between people who orient around a religion, uh, who people, people who orient around religion differently. I, I love to think of the great line by the political philosopher Michael Walzer on this. He says that the challenge of the diverse democracy is to embrace its differences and maintain a common life. The challenge of the diverse democracy is to embrace its differences and maintain a common life. That's a fancy way of saying unity in diversity, or at the very least, commonality in diversity. Dr. Birmingham and I were having a, a few words before, uh, before I came to the podium. He basically said to me, dude, you better be inspiring or we're kicking you out. <laughs> uh, and he was talking about what, what he sees as powerful in the model that we're creating at Interfaith Youth Corps is the centrality of service, right? I want to speak about that for a second because I think that the best way you build a di diverse democracy that embraces its differences and maintains a common life is that you bring people from different backgrounds together in a common endeavor in a way in which they can voice their particularity. And I think that best common endeavor is service. One of the powerful things about service is that every religious and philosophical tradition recognizes the importance of serving others. Right? What's the Good Samaritan story about at the end of the day? It's about the holiness of the Samaritan picking up the person laying by the side of the road. What does Rama in Islam mean? It means mercy, right? What is the golden rule across religious traditions about? It's about doing unto others. And the beautiful part of that is it's not just philosophy. It's not just abstraction. It's application. It's the actual doing. And the story that I want to tell you about this is the story of Habitat for Humanity. How many of you all have heard of Habitat for Humanity in here? How many of you have participated? Okay, so I love Habitat for Humanity precisely because it's that hands-on service. I spent many a weekend in my college years getting up at like 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning and going in uh, and going and volunteering for Habitat for Humanity builds. And one of the things that always struck me was that those builds brought together people from all kinds of different backgrounds. And we had conversations about what it was from our various backgrounds that brought us there. Now. That's how we built the in initial model of the Interfa Youth Corps. We actually ran a Habitat for Humanity build in Hyderabad, India, because we thought to ourselves, well, what if we brought people together to actually do service and then ask the question, what is it about your faith or philosophical background, your Muslimness, your Hinduness, your Jewishness, your Baha'iness, your secular humanness that inspires you to do this work? Quote me some scripture. Tell me a story. Lift up a hero from your tradition so that I can learn more about it, right? I'm not pretending that I'm like you. I'm just appreciating the story that you're telling. And in you telling your Buddhist story, it opens up the opportunity for me to tell my Muslim story or my Hindu story. So the beautiful thing about this is that when Habitat for Humanity, the international organization based in Georgia, found out about our work bringing people from different religious communities together in Habitat projects, they reached out to us. And one of the things that they said was, we want you to know we started as an organization for this exact purpose. They are not just an organization devoted to helping people build houses for those who can't afford them, as profound and important and inspiring as that is. They're an organization that started with an ecumenical mission as well. The founder, Millard Fuller, recognized that it was hard for people from different wings of Christianity, for Pentecostals and Presbyterians to come together to talk about the nature of Jesus because they disagreed on the nature of Jesus. But what they could do is act in accordance with the ethics of Jesus. They could engage in what Millard Fuller called the theology of the hammer. And that's where he gets the idea for Habitat for Humanity. It's the engagement of the theology of the hammer. And those are the kinds of programs, I think, that are most profound and effective when it comes to engaging especially religious diversity. So how can Highline Community College, how can this community, Des Moines, Washington, one of the most diverse communities in the country, somebody told me that the most diverse zip code in America is just a couple of miles over, right? In what ways can you conceive 
of using service as a vehicle to bring unity to diversity, not uniformity, not we are all the same, but a common table around which we can sit in our chairs and share our stories of what inspires us to do concrete service. That's the second part of my story. Here's the third part. I want to tell you the story of, uh, of my friend Cassie Meyer, right? And the reason I want to tell this story is because so much of interfaith leadership is about personal transformation. It's about the encounters that individuals go through and the role of college campuses really in formation, right? And helping people become who they want to be, what they were meant to be. So Cassie grew, grew up not far from here in, in a, she would say, a pretty secular household, right? One with a lot of ethics and values and a moral core, but not a particularly religious belief system. When she was in high school, she decides to become an evangelical Christian. And she goes to uh, an evangelical church for a few years in high school. And when she goes to college in Wisconsin, it turns out that at this little college in Wisconsin, Lawrence in Appleton, Wisconsin, there's only enough Christians right, from all different backgrounds, the Presbyterians, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics, the Catholics, they can only form one Christian group. And so Cassie's having a tough time with this because she came from a brand of Christianity that, you know, had a different kind of view of other sorts of Christians. So she's struggling with this. But, man, she had no idea what she was about to encounter because one day in the library, dude from Bangladesh approaches her with a sheet of paper from an Anthropology 101 class. And he sits down and he says, my name is Muhammad. I am an international student from Bangladesh, and I've got this assignment for Anthropology 101. We have to do a study of a distinctive tribal group and I've been like observing your group, like your Wednesday night song circle and you know the vans you guys take to church on Sunday and like the little bracelets you wear and like the shirts and like, so question one, is there a name for your tribe? <laughs> and Cassie's like, I'm the white American Christian girl from Seattle, right? What do you, what do you mean tribe? But she goes through this set of questions and she finds out that a Muslim from Bangladesh looks at her and her way of being as distinctive, as something worthy of an Anthropology 101 project. And then Cassie's like, give me, give me that sheet of paper. I'm going to do this on you. And so she's like, you know, question three, what are your distinctive rituals? And he's like, well, you know, we Muslims, when we're like uh, uh, proper, we pray five times a day. And Cassie was like, you do what? She's like, I can't get half the Christians on this campus up at 9 a.m. on a Sunday to go to church. What do you mean you pray five times a day? He's like, well, it's like I don't always make it for the early prayer. The 5 a.m. prayer, that can get hard. But I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to. One day, inshallah, I will. He's like, you know, we, she's like, what are some other distinctive traits of your group? He's like, well, you know, we don't drink alcohol. Right? She's like, you're in upstate Wisconsin on a college campus. You're not drinking alcohol? Right? In the winter? Really? Okay. And she's going through this, and she's realized she's having this like internal conflict because she's hearing the very real voice of her church community back here in Seattle saying, when you encounter somebody from a different religion, you share the truth of your faith with them. That's a real voice. And she's also learning over the course of this conversation that she admires Muhammad. And that, yes, she feels like she has a deep truth that she wants to share. But that's not the only relationship she wants to have with this guy. She wants to learn from him. She wants to find out more about Islam, not as something she wants to become a part of, but just as something that she finds interesting and, frankly, admirable. Right? And she's going through all of this as this 19-year-old you know, on this college campus. And as she tells me the story, she feels like, Nobody else on her campus is going to understand this struggle. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if there's a 19-year-old in college in America not having some version of that, right? Not having some version of who am I and where do I come from and how does that connect with all of these things that I'm encountering. In my, in my book, Acts of Faith, I call this standing at the crossroads of inheritance and discovery, trying to look both ways at once. Look, that's why we do the work we do on college campuses at Interfaith Youth Corps, because it is precisely spaces like this 
that are doing things like this, that are opening up the opportunity for positive conversation across these fault lines of difference so that the fault line around religion is not inevitably and necessarily one that is filled with blood, although that's what the evening news will tell you. It is one instead that is characterized by partnerships, by goodwill, by mutual appreciation, by what we at Interfaith Youth Corps call a sense of being better together. That's my story. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. Um, so we're going to open this up for you all to ask any questions. Um, any questions in the audience for our speaker? There's a microphone there. Hi, Mr. Patel. I'm Skyman. I'm a real-life superhero, and I'm a bit of an interfaith guy myself. I study Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam. I like it all. I'm an interfaith kind of guy. And I was wondering, what got you interested in interfaith? What made you want to believe that you know, we could come together as a society here in America and actually talk about our spirituality? Who does that? Yeah. It's like a taboo. Well, thank you for that question. So, uh, I mean, I think, you know, like you, I stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So when I look back at the folks I admire the most in American history, uh, there are folks who created space for this, whether it's Martin Luther King Jr. talking about not only his own Christian faith openly, but his admiration for Gandhi and his partnership with Abraham Joshua Heschel and his correspondence with Thich Nhat Hanh, all the way to, you know, Jane Addams, who was engaging Catholics and Jews in Hull House. So, I mean, it's... I think that it's part of the best of the American tradition to open up, open up the space for this. Can I just say, I've been doing this for 15 years. I've seen lots of fascinating things. A real-life superhero I've never seen, but I appreciate seeing it. It's a small group of people who believe in servant leadership, who believe in the power of the superhero, that actually conceptualize and create their own superhero. You know, the comic book based Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, I just saw The Amazing Spider-Man 2 over the weekend, you know, superheroes are all over the place. So why not create your own? Why not be the superhero of your own story? That's what RLSH is about. Why not? Rock on, thank you. <laughs> I feel like Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't want to fly over the banister? <laughs> Hi, I'm Janita, and I work actually in the Intercultural Center on campus. And um, this year, I feel like I've been dealing with a lot of struggling with finding my place within my own identity. and. Um, before, I kind of thought it was more important to deal with other people and relationships with them, like you said, interfaith between maybe different religions. But um, I've, been, I've been experiencing a lot within my own identity and who I am. So did you ever have to deal with that, and how did you if you had to? Yeah, I mean, I thank you for that question. 100%, of course. And I, and I think that, that I think for, 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 for a lot of people, uh, and this is certainly the case with me, I think it's like it's, it's a it's a multi-part dynamic where some parts are like intense interaction with lots of folks, and then, then there's times for retreat and reflection, and a huge part of interaction is, is dealing with other people's identities, but an awful lot of it is reflecting on your own. And in fact, that's, to be geeky for a second, you know, I carry the baggage of graduate school, so I'm gonna spill a little bit of that out, of that out here. Uh, that's, that's one of the, the kind of chief characteristics of, of the era in which we live, which is, is, is constant interaction with people who are different from you. 100, 150 years ago, the vast majority of the human race didn't experience that, right? And if you're only with people who are like you, if you are in a community where everybody goes to church on Sundays and they go to the same church, well, you probably don't really ask the question, why should I go to church? Because it's, you know, it's like 
you don't ask fish what water is like, because that's all they know, right? But if you're with folks who do different things all the time, as all of us are all the time, well, the thing that we have to do that our ancestors didn't have to do is ask ourselves, well, why do I do this? Basically, who am I? That's a really intense question, and, and college is the time when I think it's felt most intensely. So I think it's this back and forth dynamic of, uh, of engagement with other people's identities, causing reflection on one's own, and then you know, taking retreat and reflection time to, to ask those questions. And for me, reading, reading the stories of, of other folks as they came to a sense of who they were through that interaction and then retreat process was really powerful for me. So, I mean, in part, that's what Acts of Faith, my first book, is about. It's kind of that, that process, including the painful part of it. Okay, we got a question in the back. All right, well, I want to say thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm faculty here at Highline, and I work with future teachers. Many of my students are in the classroom, or in the room today. Um, and I think that what you said around diversity being a fact, we're very proud of our fact. Right, we just won a great award from the American Association of Community Colleges for all the work we do with diversity, and I, um, I love that about Highline, but I think that you are bringing another challenge to us, is how can we address this topic that we don't know how to talk about um, on campus. It's really brought to mind for me, what are the things that my future teachers who are gonna be working in the most diverse district in the um, United States, possibly the world, um, how are they gonna prepare themselves to work in such diverse communities and as we have so many um, Muslim teachers coming down the road, yeah, right? I ask great. our public schools prepared to support them yeah. in the work that they're going to do and so I just hope that faculty here listening to this really take this as a challenge and see how we can um, value our fact but also continue to have these conversations that allow us to learn from each other. Um, so thank you so much Thanks. for everything you shared. Hey, listen, thank you so much. Let me, let me just say, uh, as, I, as I told Skyman there, uh, I've been doing this for 15 years, right? And in 15 years, I've gotten exactly two community college invitations. One of them was from the college I went to. And they knew, th they, knew they could get me for free because my mom works there. <laughs> the other is you guys, right? So, I mean, I think... I think that's a big deal. I think, I think that, that is a, that's a really big deal. Uh, uh, and I think that that is, that, is in, that is an engagement of a dimension of diversity. That is, it's, it's volatile. I mean, you know, this is the, the robust engagement of religious identity and diversity issues is, is a significant challenge. And there's the vast majority of institutions in your sector are saying, look, we prioritize other challenges, which makes a ton of sense to me. But to have, to have you guys who are willing to, you know, take a step out a little bit and say, we want to look at this. I'm just, you know, that's why, that's why we made this a priority, right, to come here. And it's, I was telling uh, uh, Dr. Birmingham earlier, this is, this is our, it's a gift to us to sit with you and learn from you and to get a sense of how you are articulating this challenge to yourselves? Is it because of the diversity of your own student body? Is it because uh, uh, so many of you are off to be teachers and nurses, which I just think is great. I think it's the most important work in the world. And you are gonna be working in, in hospitals and in schools that are highly diverse, you know, in which, uh, you know, for, for Hindus if, and, and for many Buddhists, when the school or hospital cafeteria says, our soup is vegetarian with a little bit of chicken, that doesn't cut it, right? It, it, it might cut it for other folks, but, but it doesn't cut it for people for whom that's a religious commitment, right? Like, you know, most Muslims, they, they won't take the bacon off. They just won't eat it, right? And for like a Muslim nine-year-old, he probably's not gonna tell you. He's probably just not gonna eat. So to have a, to have a radar screen for that, and that's that's what that that's what that initial conversation with my dad helped me develop, which was a radar screen. Like I didn't think about religious identity and diversity issues because of college. I developed a radar screen around race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, class, but I didn't develop a radar screen around religious diversity issues. And I just I just think that it's. 
I'm going to be blunt and bold in saying this. I, I don't think you can call yourself an educated person in 21st century America without that radar screen. I just want to thank you very much for coming here. I got a lot out of what you said, and I want to tell you that I really appreciate the fact that you said that America is one of the leading countries, one of the finest that is um, uh, engaging in diversity and religious diversity of all kinds. I want to thank you for that comment because I've been believing that same thing because I've, I watched, I'm a person that watches the news. In America, we have a lot of great organizations here. There are human rights, animal uh, activists, people and everything. And we do try to intervene when people in other countries are being mistreated if we can. And so I want to thank you for that, and, and thank you, and I'm, I'm glad that you came because everyone will recognize America is a great country, right? So, I, I think you know I think that there are such inspiring parts of the American tradition. Actually, that's what my book Sacred Ground is about, and I think that the challenge for America has long been and continues to be: will the forces of pluralism defeat the forces of prejudice? And I don't think that's that's a, that's that's a battle that's never put to rest. It's a battle that's fought every generation, and we have the chance to fight it in ours. And I think that that's a privilege. So thank you for your comment. Hello, my name is LaTanya and I'm in student government. Thank you for being here as well. Um, I wanted to ask you for students who are here as well as students who are not here, how do we, um, let me read, I wrote it down so let me read it here. How do we present this topic to students, mostly for students who aren't present? Mm -hmm. And do you have any tools that we can use as students in having this conversation or continuing on? this sort of education? Yeah, it's, what a great question. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, so I would say, uh, I mean, I, I think the Intercultural Center here, my sense is it's going to be the nerve center of a lot of this. And I think having a set of conversations with, with Natasha and others about what set of programs you can create that in, engages in a positive way, highlights religious diversity. So at IFYC, we have, uh, we have a, something called the Better Together Campaign. We run Interfaith Leadership Institutes where students can be trained in how to run it, or you can just take stuff off of our website. But it's basically a series of interfaith service and dialogue programs that the arc of which we call the Better Together Campaign. And the, the, the kind of the uh, animating spark of all of it is the question, how does your tradition inspire you to serve others, right? It doesn't mean it's the only question, but it's a great place to start. And look, one of the reasons that people stay away from engaging religious identity and diversity is because so many conversations start with, here's what I hate about your religion. Let me just tell you, that's not a good way to start, <laughs> right? Um, that's inter it's Interfaith 101, it's still useful to go over. Uh, a really good place to start is, how, how, does, how does your belief system from secular humanists to Zoroastrian, how does it inspire you to serve others? Yeah. So what about for students who maybe don't identify with a specific religion? Yeah, so I mean that's why I include, that's why we're so forthright about including secular humanists or seekers from wherever somebody is, right? From wherever somebody is, my guess is there's a set of stories or moments that are important in that person's life. Now, perhaps you're, you know, like me and you're a committed Muslim and you come from what's a pretty cohesive tradition. And there's Quranic stories, and there's stories, meaning stories from the central scripture in Islam, the, the, the Holy Quran. There's stories from what we call the Sunnah, of the Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him. The Sunnah is the actions and statements. Right? So you might pull from that. But there's, there's, if you're from whatever background you might be from, there's probably a set of stories that you keep in your back pocket that plays a role in your life. And simply creating the space and asking the question, hey, tell me what stories inspire you, right? And folks from, from secular humanist or seeker or syncretic backgrounds have just as much of a right to share their story as folks who, are, who call themselves committed Christians or Muslims or Jews or Hindus. Hi, my name is Michelle. Um, I just had a question. As a Christian woman, um, you know, I walk around and I hear a lot of people's opinions and, um, and that go against what I believe. And I just want to see how do I shift from wanting to protect my belief to, to being able to hear their story and not want to change their story? Man, what a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, so 
I think that there's, so my view on this is that is somebody's faith or philosophical identity ought to be dealt with with the same dimension of uh, sensitivity as other dimensions of their identity, right? Now, that doesn't mean that somebody shouldn't be able to disagree with the philosophical or belief system. I think that's entirely legitimate, especially in a college campus. But I think, I think statements like, you know, Muslims are evil or Christians are dumb, I just think, my, in my view, that's like, I insert another identity in that, and it's impermissible. In my view, that's the same thing when it comes to a religious identity. However, right, I think that uh, you or I or anybody else, we ought to be able to have uh, an intelligent conversation with people who we disagree with and ought to have it in a way that seeks to build a relationship and an appreciative knowledge of that other person's perspective rather than simply, well, you know, let me tell you what I hate about your system, right? Asking a set of, asking a set of questions, I don't understand this, or I disagree with that, you know? Um, I think that that's a very different thing than walking around saying Muslims are evil, you know? So I'll tell you a personal story uh, uh, about this on, on my account. So, you know, I have a Muslim family. We're raising our two boys, Zayd and Khalil, to be Muslims, as best we can at least. And a part of that is we sent them to Catholic school, at least Khalil, Catholic preschool, right? <laughs> Which, by the way, it's, this is standard operating procedure for, you know, hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world. South Asia, Middle East, lots of, lots of Muslims uh, um, send their kids to, to, to Catholic schools. So around Easter time, you know, we have a set of serious conversations with a four-year-old about, you know, Christology. <laughs> uh, because... Khalil's preschool teacher, as ought to be the case at a Catholic school, is teaching the hugely important Easter event in Christianity. Jesus died on the cross, was crucified for the sins of, um, of the human race, and that's how human beings are saved, right? If you believe in Jesus, and, and particularly the, the event of the crucifixion, so we Muslims don't believe that. Right? We have great reverence for Jesus as a prophet, but we do not agree with Jesus being the Son of God or the event of the crucifixion. Now, I have a four-year-old who's the first adult outside of the, his family that he loves is his teacher, Miss Terrace, at St. Ben's Elementary School. I have to articulate our Muslim identity to Khalil around the event of the crucifixion in a way that doesn't make him think Miss Terrace is wrong or bad, just that we are different. And my sense is that that's like not a, that's a reasonably good way of thinking about the engaging somebody with a different religion. You get to be who you are. We get to be who we are. How do we do it in a way that builds a relationship, especially at that really formative level, right? Um, I mean, that, that's, that's how I think we have learned in, in different dimensions of the United States to, to, to treat other people's identities, to treat other dimensions of identity. I just think that the same type of kind of educated sensitivity uh, around diversity ought to be at play when it comes to religious identity. I'm next. It's, it's very interesting to me to see you coming from a very positive views and, and preaching your interfaith without uh, commenting on your challenges being a Muslim or even a uh, different color skin. Uh, did that in any way uh, shape you? Or oh, least? yeah. So, um, I, mean, that's, I mean, this is Acts of Faith. My first book is, you know, a good part of it is, is, that, is that challenging story, right, for, for me. Uh, and I mean, I think I shared a little bit of that, right? Like, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the wanting to be white for the first 15 years of my life, right? for, from the age of 2 to, fi to 17, basically. Um, yeah, that, that played a shaping role. But, you know, I mean, my dad, my dad once said to me, he's like, there is no doubt that communities, nations, religions need, a, need improvement. 
but how are you most likely, Ibu, to spark improvement? Are you most likely to spark improvement by telling, telling them how bad they are, right? Or are you most likely to spark improvement by, by articulating uh, an image of what they could be when they have been that in the past and trying to inspire them in that direction. And I, I guess that, that, that always made sense to me. I mean, that's who I am. I mean, I, I guess part of that is just my personality. Um, part of that is, I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, what do I have to complain about, right? What, and, and so, meaning like, I get to do work that I love. Uh, I, I got to start my own organization based on something that I believe in. Um, I get invited to talk about issues that I think are important. I get to interface with super inspiring students, uh, extremely engaged faculty, you know? I just, I just ask God to let me keep doing this. Um, thank you so much for your talk. And that really brings me to the question of what can we do in like our action? And oftentimes we see change in an individualized way and we, we need to start thinking in more collective terms. So how do we move into this religious diversity of moving just beyond from a fact of how we engage? Similar when we talk about race, you know, it's founded on this whole idea of white supremacy. And so similarly, we, we look at institution or power structure, we're often is founded by this dominant culture of Christianity. So how do we see when United States it's almost like a spiritual battleground in the state of, you know, when we drove out First Nation folks, you know, we kind of really wiped out the indigenous spirituality, and now we have this whole, you know, Islamophobia along with that. So I, I guess I'm just curious to hear from, from a, in the institution of that power structure, how do we work with dominant cultures where that narrative is so strong? Yeah. So, you know, I... I find that a very interesting question. Um, I have multiple responses to it. I guess the first response is I don't, I don't frame it that way. Right? I, understand, I understand that that is a framing of it. Um, uh, I'm, I am fluent in that framing. Um, uh, it's not the way that I, I personally choose to frame it, and it's not the, it's not the way we frame it at, at Interfaith Youth Corps. I'll just tell you a quick story of how that, that, that kind of came to be for me. Um, uh, two, two quick stories. You know, so so the, the terms privilege, oppression, colonialism used to be a, a much more common part of my own lexicon. And I certainly understand why they are a part of, of the lexicon period, right? My dad once pointed out to me, he's like, look, Notre Dame University starts in the early mid 19th century, an institution built in South Bend, Indiana by French Catholics for Catholics. And they let me in, in the mid 1970s to do an MBA there. And there are 235 Catholic institutions of higher education across America. And you could probably count five that are only for Catholics. Right? And by the way, uh, if you want to talk about a group that's been oppressed across American history, Catholics would be in the top five. The great historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. once said that the deepest bias in the American people is its anti-Catholic prejudice. Now, my own view is that there's a number of communities, African Americans, Native Americans, lesbians and gays, that would have a shot at that crown, but Catholics would certainly be in the top five. And yet, they built a set of institutions that have broadly served the diversity of America. There's 600 Catholic hospitals in the United States. So, and again, you probably couldn't, there's probably not 10 that only, that, that, that are exclusively for Catholics. Why, why am I saying all of this? I'm saying all of this because it seems to me that another way of framing the issue is to say, how is it that particular groups in the United States can keep a sense of pride and particularity in their own identity and build institutions from their own inspiration that serve the common good, right? That's, that's, for me, that, that's, a, that's a more useful framing. But look, you know, I mean, I could do Saeed as well as anybody, you know, so I love that stuff. And it's, it's not that I don't, that I don't find it, I find, not find it intriguing and useful. I, I will say this, I was at Columbia University uh, uh, on the other side of the, which is a very different institution than this, right? Um, uh, you know, and like all these like upper middle class kids talking to me about how they're oppressed. And I'm like, dude, I mean, you're not oppressed, okay? Like, I understand the guy three Spivak got like a chair in something here, but like, you're not oppressed, right? 
that doesn't mean that growing up brown in Staten Island wasn't hard. I get that. But at the end of the day, you're at Columbia, like every Pakistani peasant in that country would trade places with you. So stop acting like you're in, their, you're in the same position as they are, you know? So um, anyway, the limits of Saeed from my point of view. <laughs> Okay, um, I just saw the time, and I see we're running out of time, so I'm going to take the last question, and then for the other folks who have questions, um, you guys can maybe talk to Ibu after. Really? Okay. <laughs> All right, then I'll take the person up here. Hi, I'd just like to say that um, I'm a kind of older than most people um, going to college here, but... Um, Throughout my life, I've learned that the things that you're saying, like about the um, it, when the lady over here said she her religion, she had a part, part, hard time trying to um, tell people or not tell people. Um, it's it's like the Good Samaritan story that you said. Okay, you can either be the Samaritan or you cannot be the Samaritan. You know, you can either help or not help. And if your um, religious um, um, Faith has you to not help do for others or care for others worldwide. I mean, just on, a, on what they believe in, just love them from the human aspect of being a human being. Okay, then you need, maybe need, you, need, you need to back up on your faith because we have racism, we have ageism, we have all kind of um, isms here going on, you know, in life. And throughout life, it's, it's easier and it's a lot more peaceful in your heart to accept someone for who they are. I love that. Thank you. It's a lot more peaceful in your heart to accept someone. For the beautiful. Thank you. I think we'll leave it at that. Thanks, everyone. I'll be signing some books over here if folks are interested. I love being here. I'm looking forward to being with you for the rest of the day.